Welcome to Tuesdays with BOA. My name is Dan Hurd. I'm the Director of Adult Programs at Writers and Books. Writers and Books is a nonprofit literary center in Rochester, New York. We offer readings, writing workshops, and other literary programming for people of all ages and backgrounds, all currently available online. For more information uh, about us and our upcoming events, you can visit our website at wab.org. We're so glad to be able to partner with Bo Editions uh, tonight to bring you John Gallagher. First, John will read a selection, then he'll be in conversation with Peter Connors, Boa's publisher and executive director. If you have a question, feel free to submit it through the Q&A. John Gallagher's previous poetry collection, In a Landscape, was published by Boa Editions in 2014. He's also the co-author together with G.C. Waldrop of Your Father on the Train of Ghosts. His poetry collection, The Little Book of Guesses, received the Lev's Poetry Prize. He is a co-editor of the Laurel Review and the Akron Series in Contemporary Poetics. An assistant professor of English at Northwest Missouri State, he lives in Maryville, Missouri. In brand new spacesuit, John Gallagher writes with honesty, humor, and tenderness about caring for his aging parents. With exquisite attention to detail, Gallagher captures the losses, anxieties, and possibilities that come with caring for one another. Brand new spacesuit is available in our bookstore ampersand books. I'll put the link in the chat. Uh, that all said, uh, John, thank you for being here. Thank you very much, Dan. And uh, is it is it, am I going now? I'm going. Oh, you're okay. Hey. Hello, hello everyone. Uh, I'm going to start. Uh, I'm going to read mostly from uh, mostly from uh, Brand New Spacesuit. I'm going to take a slight detour into my prior book um, in a landscape, just in the middle for a minute. So I'm going to read for about 20 minutes, and then we're going to chat for a little bit. I'm going to start with the opening poem in the book. It's a poem about my longing for a synesthetic experience, I suppose the new formality. You approach the world from a great distance. If I should love you more, you are to say, then I shall love you more. Such things are elemental, like how the failures of a country are to be repeated because there's a center to things. Approach the backyard as if the backyard were a sudden appearance. Approach the car as if you were one half of a medallion broken in antiquity by a mystical king to stop some great evil power and you're forever now in search of your missing twin. My car should never have this power over one, you are to say. Then I shall love it more. The road is a kicked up veil of fallen leaves and this incantation you're in where you're driving and your thoughts unspool beneath you there are these two ideas that one grows through nurture and that one grows through strife. They're in identical boxes on a shelf in your garage. Say you're thinking, there are no things here but in the ideas of things, wanting to break back the 20th century from a hole in the yard. You're a king of things. Bring back that time when my child was six, you ask the road ahead of you, driveway after driveway. For love, there are things you must say. The stripe in the road glistens. It rises in front of you, floating in perfect orange. The best orange you've ever seen. An orange that says, you'll never see orange this orange again. This will be the definition of orange that will continually rise before you and behind you down the road unbroken. I will love you more. So one of the things about uh, that poem is I usually pronounce the word orange as orange. Um, and I have had many conversations with people about orange versus orange. And uh, so I've decided when I read that poem aloud, I read it as orange. And in my mind, I'm translating that to orange so that I can understand what I'm talking about. <laughs> and uh, so I'm just going to jump right back into it here. Uh, this is a poem about feeling close to an answer, the history of my blood. 
Sometimes I feel I'm one step away, that it would be just that easy or close. And I can't decide if it's a step toward or a step away from, or if this means I'm lost or on tour, how I feel watching visualizations of the universe from this spec out to some other spec and then back from blood to blood, fibrous universe in which my blood is busy pouring juice, where the horror movie review starts with a lesson in pacing and then everything goes nuts. It's a lament about a man trapped in his own head, circling with pointed descriptions of his slowly mutating depression being cushioned by swelling strings and a backing chorus of deliberative oohs and ahs, blood of my blood. I'm trying to keep things simple. In the traditional tale of the babes in the wood, the two children are abandoned in the wood, die there and are covered with leaves by robins dust of my dust, universe of tubes and wires, adding a village of friendly elves and a happy ending. I keep seeing these DNA test commercials where some guy thinks he's Irish and his blood says otherwise, his blood crying out in humiliation and melodrama. I could be anyone, his blood says. How do you like yourself so far? His blood continues for behind a tree in the wood. My blood wants to hit the stand-up comedy circuit. It thinks it's so funny. Though I tell it over and over, it's not funny. It says, remember that time at your mother's funeral? She died of so many things that statistically the rest of the family gets to live forever. So I'm gonna take a step back now, a um, few years. This is back to 2014 um, from In a Landscape. Uh, it's also uh, available. <laughs> uh, it's a book length poemish memoir thing. So here we go. This is number 12. It's a 72 section poem, and this is the 12th section. Roman numerals don't do much for people who like zero. O, null, nil, or not. Zero was conceptual as in Arabic numerals where the whole thing seems more conceptual, at least to me right now, sitting here trying to remember how to count in Roman, let alone imagine subtraction, division, etc. I should break in for a second in this poem to say that the sections are in Roman numerals. So in a landscape, number 12 is XII. And so here I am thinking about why I did that to myself when I'm terrible at them. I was looking at the alphabet in my daughter's second grade classroom the other day, wondering why the vowels were so mathematically distributed. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, Q, R, S, T, U, V, W, X, Y, Z. Vowel, three consonants. Vowel, three consonants. Vowel, five consonants. Vowel, five consonants, vowel, five consonants, as long as you ignore the uncertain status of Y, which reminds me of the uncertain status of the zero, nulla, nihil, how can nothing be something? Indeed, I have nothing to say and I am saying it is perhaps the most famous thing John Cage wrote. He went on to write seven or so books on the topic. I've always enjoyed thinking of nothing as something, this something called nothing that one can hold. It turns a lot of ghosts into people you can sit and have dinner with. A guy I knew 15 years ago named Todd Carmen felt like he was becoming nothing. He'd tell me about it while we rolled newspapers. He was the distribution manager. He counted the papers. He always asked inappropriate questions about women as if I'd know the answers. All I wanted was to get out and throw my route. It was always 2 a.m. back then. He was always inviting me over to his place. He just seemed like another clueless 20-something, like we all were. One night, he didn't come in. He was busy killing people, or trying to, with a 22 gauge target rifle. It took 13 shots to kill the one guy, I heard, in his living room. The guy just stood there 
trying to talk him out of it. He also killed the guy's girlfriend and he shot his own ex-girlfriend, Shannon, a few times, once through the neck, but she didn't die. She died two years later of an asthma attack on the way back from Mexico after having spent several months in jail there for trying to buy diet pills. What a life. Later, he said he heard them laughing downstairs and he knew, he just knew they were laughing at him. While they were bleeding out on the living room rug, he shot several times into the wall, trying to get to the apartment next door. Looking it up just now, all I could find is San Marcos Daily Record, Carmen, Todd, shooting spree, 7 12 91. When he ran out of energy, he called his brother and then went out on the front step where his brother met him and waited with him for the police. Back to brand new spacesuit now. Hollywood endings. I regret not saying everything I could, everything I thought to my children, and thinking that was somehow protecting them. That the world doesn't care what happens to you. That's one thing, and I said that, but it didn't come out that way, I meant it. What I said was, sure is cold this morning. How we keep kind of thinking there's a plan or an aesthetic rightness to things. If we can only find it or work at it or dream it hard enough, but I said, maybe later we can go look at the Christmas lights. The shore is nowhere to be seen. I've no idea what I'm standing on. It looked like the shore. I could even make out the brush and tree line, but as I look behind me now, driving home, it's all the same water. And I meant to say that, and I meant it as a question, but it came out more, does anyone want to stop for a snack? We can't step outside the box in order to look within because the box is all there is. It's always high school, all the things you're in, that you're ever in, but that also means it'll all be over soon, that it, whatever it is, will grow more distant, like that lake we went to last summer, or that town you used to live in but haven't for years, and you remember one afternoon for no reason how frightened you were of the crossing guard you'd see most days, maybe for no good reason and maybe for very good reasons. If you could only know. I wanna say these things are out there in the world together, but all I can think of is this recurring dream where I suddenly remember I have several cats in the basement I've not thought of in weeks, and now I'm afraid to look. My life in brutalist architecture. My neighbor to the left had a stroke a couple years ago. It didn't look like he was gonna make it, and then he made it. I'm watching him now from the window as he makes his slow way across his yard with some tree branches that fell in last night's storm. Three steps, wait, three steps. It's a hard slog. Watching, I wanna pitch in, and we do at such times, wanting to help. But on the other hand, it's good to be as physical as possible in recovery. Maybe this is part of his rehab. Maybe this is doctor's orders, do yard work. And here he comes with his, um, sorry, and here comes his wife across the yard anyway, to give a hand with a large branch. She's able to quickly overtake him and she folds into the process smoothly, no words between them that I can make out. It's another part of what makes us human, weighing the theory of mind, watching each other struggle or perform, anticipating each other's thoughts as the abject hovers uncannily in the background, threatening to break through the fragile borders of the self. What's it like to be a bat, we ask? The bats don't respond. How usually our lives unfold at the periphery of catastrophes happening to others. I'm reading while my neighbor struggles that the squirrel population in New England is in the midst of an unprecedented boom. 
A recent abundance of acorns is the reason for this surge in squirrel populations, most particularly in New Hampshire. They're everywhere being squirrely, squirreling acorns away. We call it squirrel nado because it's all around us, circling and dangerous and kind of funny. Language springs from the land and through our imagination, we become human. They're back at the house now. We name the things we see or they name themselves into our experience, whichever. And then we use those names for things we don't understand, what we can't express. Wind becomes spirit, becomes ghost. Mountain becomes God. The land springs up before us. It shakes us and pushes us over. Um, side note to that poem, uh, that he got better and they moved. Um, and we were very sad uh, about them moving, both because we liked them very much, but also they had a, a vacant lot next to their house. And the person who bought the house is now putting up a very large shed in that beautiful um, lot we had next to us with trees. And he took all the trees out and put a shed in which he's putting a boat, some ATVs, and a lo very large riding mower. So uh, time uh, marches on, as they, as they say. This next poem was the very last poem I put in the book. So this is the newest poem from Brand New Spacesuit. It's about a drive across Missouri called 15 Miles from the End of Time. I just passed a horrific deer massacre on Highway 36 between Cameron and Hannibal. Five or six of them came charging across the highway. I could see them cross the westbound lanes in Berm and I eased up on the gas, measuring distance between deer and road and speed. And if a deer is traveling 15 miles an hour and you are traveling 70-ish, but the 18-wheeler ahead of me either didn't see or didn't have options. So the deer, as one, ran directly into the side of it. I've never seen anything like it, like the brake shot in pool the way they scattered, spinning across the highway. One, two, three, four, five. Maybe the first one cleared the cab. I don't know. I hope so, for all our sakes. But the rest came spinning at me down the highway. So many spinning tops or fireworks, dead and wondering eyes, heavy and pinwheeling bodies. My swerving meant nothing, but I swerved a little onto the shoulder, ba boom and they're lilting back onto the highway, and then it's just me and the 18-wheeler, like none of this happened. So is the driver thinking about it? Is the driver shaking right now, glad to be alive, laughing even? I don't want to know. I suddenly have never less wanted to know anything in my entire life. And here I am overtaking it, about ready to pass. So do I look up? Do I hope to see the knowing look in the driver's eyes? A kind of lamenting Jesus for us all? Peace unto you, the least of my children? At some point, you find yourself home or wherever you're going. Easy enough to say. But even there, the moments pile up. In aggregate, someone on the radio just said about something to do with presidents or the Justice Department. I wasn't really listening, but I caught that in aggregate. I repeat, in aggregate. How in aggregate we make it home. In aggregate, there will be more deer tomorrow attempting Highway 36. In aggregate, you will run out of time as if it were a house and then a house on fire and you will look back and wonder where you are, where anyone is. I will, I will finish this little part of tonight's program with the very last poem from the book. It's called Get Out of Jail Free. And Natalie's my daughter. Natalie was telling me this morning that she's always felt responsible for our cat Dixie's death several years ago. She has never mentioned it before. And now here we are, end of April, and she's confessing. As you would expect, it comes down to, I pushed her off my chair and then a few days later she died. 
they're coming for us, the secret police, for our imagined murders and betrayals. I likewise killed our cat Lowell 15 years ago. I still think about it, how he came into the bathroom and I pointed the hairdryer at him. And he ran out of the, into the living room, jumped up on the couch and died. What are the last things any of us have said to anyone who then died? How the sun will rise tomorrow becomes the sun will not rise tomorrow, but until, and, but until then it will. And now the sudden significance of breakfast chatter or some short response to a question just as you were getting off work. The last thing I said to Roger, though he didn't actually die for another six months, was a text. As he wasn't around much, was kind of hiding out. Are you sick? I asked. People are telling me you're ill. How are you? I felt good about it at the time, sending that text, but he never replied. So now I feel bad that I was maybe invading his privacy. But he'd been a friend of mine, and I thought we still were. But we weren't by then. As the next year, a student wrote a poem in one of my classes in his honor accusing all of us who worked with him of not caring, of not being there for him, how he felt like he had to hide that we were trying to get him fired for being sick. You throw your heart and you keep throwing your heart. You lose people and things, and this is how they come back. They leave you no choice. Thank you very much for sitting through that. Hey, John. Hey, Peter. Thank you. Welcome beautiful. back. That was that, that part was awkward. As I, for a moment, I was thinking to myself, wait a minute, I stopped reading everything and, and now I'm alone. And will they come back? Have they all have they all left? It was a very it was my little ex existential crisis. I didn't know I was going to be having tonight. You know, that actually segues into something uh, that I thought I'd start <laughs> the conversation with, which was right as you were ending that last poem, I jotted down the tragedy of every day. And, you know, as you were reading it really, this is something. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Well, now that's a tragedy. That is an existential tragedy uh, that Peter Connors has just frozen. Uh, is the problem on your end? Dan, do you hear us? Yes, I can still hear you. Oh, good. So Peter, <laughs> Peter is having an existential crisis, and we can't help him because he's froze in his existential crisis. We, we must reach out to him in some fashion um, and save him from. <laughs> he's a he's yeah, a statuesque I, I presence. Would say for him to. Uh, oh, he's back. Join and restart. Oh. <laughs> you had an existential back, crisis, Peter. Peter, and you're you're on mute now. Oh, he's still on mute. Oh. Can you hear me? Yes. That's good. Sorry uh -oh. about that. Ah, fart. Hey, Amy. Someone's watching Netflix, I think. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, if that happens one more time, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dart into the other room where my stepson is probably playing a video game and uh, <laughs> see if I can get that taken care of. But one of the um, one of the things I thought is, is the way that you reveal the act of writing poetry as you're writing it. And I'm thinking particularly about like some of the lines like I meant to say that, you know, I meant to say this as a question, uh, but it came out as and it's very much something we do in our everyday, but it's certainly a part of writing poetry too. And in that way, you sort of bring us into the creative process. And I'm curious, is this something that you're, you know, is, is a very conscious thing? Is this part of your aesthetic and how does it fit into it? There, there is a French phrase. I call, of course, I, don't, I won't remember the French, French way to say it. I could say it with a bad French accent maybe, but I think it's called something like this uh, stairwell thinking or hallway thinking it's it's or stairwell thoughts or hallway thoughts it's the it's the idea of having the idea after you've left the experience and uh if i was to say there's a theme there's like a theme for my life it would be that i'm i'm always thinking of what i should have just even even like as you say in the moment of something i'm realizing what i should have just done like three or four seconds earlier um and that is so it, I, I think because it is my natural way to think, 
um, it becomes my natural way to write notes down. As, and so, so sometimes when we write notes and things toward poems and such, we, we cross something out and then put down the better thing. Um, and so, and sometimes, and of course I do that as everyone, as most people do that, but sometimes I do like to leave that first thing in and still correct it um, because it feels somehow more, I, I have this dream, this kind of Lynn Higinian dream that she said, she said one time, about uh, wanting poetry to be uh, thought transference. And so in my mind, uh, the closest thing I could get to thought transference would be to, to actually encompass the, the ways we really think and the ways I really think and to try to get them down as, as close as possible in, in the work. Um, maybe that comes from Ashbery. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, this is, this is another thing and I, especially for some reason that puts me in mind of, of John Cage, who you, you refer to a lot. And there's something about leaving that space in there and having the reader fill in the space. And, but, you know, I was also looking at your epigraphs and I have this sort of theory that like epigraphs are the poets, they're leaving us like a secret code, you know, to decode their work somehow in the epigraphs they choose. And, and so I went back and I looked at your last two BOA books and you have epigraphs from John Cage, Shakespeare, David Bowie, and then of course, Roger Cerrone's John Ashbery. And if this is a secret code, what is it telling us about your work? I, 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 I bow, I bow to, to greater minds on that, on that. <laughs> um, it's, uh, you know, I, I just really like all those, all those old ideas, the, uh, the the Lynn Higinian idea about, about thought transference or uh you know all the all the modernist ideas and of of well the what the Black Mountain idea I think it was Robert Duncan maybe who had the, who has who said something like everything that happens around the composition of the poem belongs in the poem um he said something like that um and of course he probably didn't really mean it I'm sure that he revised constantly but but the idea that everything that happens around the poem is possible to appear in the poem is, is available to the poem and to have a poetry open to the notes around the poem. I really, I love that. I, uh, you know, people asked, uh, you know, that, that became the kind of the, the cliche reading of, of Ashbery or not cliche, the, the easy reading of Ashbery is that Ashbery's poetry is like the way we think, right? That a kind of idea that's that become, even he kind of, he kind of at some points even kind of bought into that idea a little bit. But you know, when I read Ashbery's poetry, I don't at all get the feeling that I think that way. You know, maybe he did, but his poems don't feel like my thoughts to me. And so I thought, well, what, what, if if I take that idea um, that that he has or that people had for his poetry, um, and actually really try it, and so that's that's what comes out. And there is there there's a downside to it. There's a there are a lot of downsides to that uh, to that kind of. Um, I don't know. I, I would call it radical inclusion. Um, and for me, the downside is that there there does become the possibility of a certain kind of uh, tonal similarity or 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 similarity of of general thrust of the of the pieces. And so it makes if you you're kind of one of those things where if, if you can say anything, it all kind of ends up sounding like you can say anything, you know. And so it's like, well, how do you get back out of that? So 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 now I'm I'm you know. I, I hear that voice and I don't like hearing that voice. I tell it to shut up. I say, go away voice, <laughs> go do something else. <laughs> you know, that, that answer just drew a line for me that I've never drawn with your work, but it's sort of, it went from Black Mountain to, to Charles Olson to, to Maximus. And I mean, I, I never thought of that with your, you know, the idea of including everything, but that, that makes a lot of sense to me actually. Um, and I've certainly thought about Ashbery's connection to visual art and your connection to visual art and specifically collage. And so I, I, I had to move spaces to try and get a better Wi-Fi, so I don't have my book with me, but maybe you could hold up the front cover of the new book. And that is a collage that John did. Um, so I'd love if you could talk to us a little about that specific collage and also just collage in general. Mm -hmm. uh, so this this collage is really interesting because it's it's actually this one here this collage uh, kind of wraps around the the book is a uh, is is collaborative 
this is a collaborative collage with uh, Sandy Knight, uh, the amazing book designer uh, that does a lot of a lot of boa books, and uh, actually worked worked on this one as well, um, the the last book. And uh, so all of the elements on the cover are from my collages, but she recollaged them uh, to make them more because my collages tend to be uh, they tend to be something seen right there and when you do a book cover you have to have space for titles and all this other kind of stuff so 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 she so we collaborated on that and I actually I I did the pieces and she collab she took them and did a whole nother thing so it wasn't it wasn't a back and forth uh, um, but for me uh, collage and you can see a couple on my wall I don't know can I do this let's see what happens if I try to do this there's one so that's that's one collage um, and the other one is back there. This is, that's actually, uh, I can't really reach it. Um, that one I like a lot that's on the back wall. Um, and uh, I was gonna say something about them. It's, it's really important to me. I have, I have a pile of National Geographics as we're speaking. So this guy is gonna be uh, in a collage soon uh, that I'm tearing apart. Uh, I was doing that the whole last, uh, last hour while I was sitting here, I was tearing apart old National Geographics. And uh, it becomes a great, oh, relaxing. It's almost like making a puzzle uh, that has no um, that has no uh, picture before it. Well, it's almost like the the the, scu the sculptor who says, "I see a block of wood," and someone says, "You what? You carve into it?" And he says, "No, I I strip away until to find the thing that really was there." Whatever what, that kind of idea. Um, and I really feel that when I make collage that there is that these people, I, I get really, I don't know, I get really woo-woo about it. I really feel like these people are having a life and I, I have a little conversation. I don't know, it's, it's very, I don't know, very pleasing to me in, in ways that nothing else in, in life is pleasing. It's a, I mean, oh, I have a very pleasing life though. I mean, not, not, not that, a wonderful family life, all that sort of thing, but there is something about um, making collage, uh, finding these old pictures and magazines that were gonna be thrown out and, giving a, a, an afterlife to these images um, is just really, I just really, it really means so much to me. So I make I, a lot of them. I feel like a lot of, like you said, a lot of the, the images come from magazines. They're almost like, almost like a stock image, you know, a woman diving into lake, you know, man hiking or whatever it might be. And, and then you have this way of putting them into a situation which is just not quite right. So I think it's like everything is very familiar, but at the same time, it's just a little bit like it turns your brain just that little bit. So you have to reevaluate it, which honestly, I mean, I think it is not a is not a far cry from what you do with your poetry. You know, in some ways, sometimes I, I read your work and in the best way, I think this this maybe shouldn't be as interesting as it is. <laughs> it's like. You know, I'm, I'm hearing about your daughter's second grade classroom. I'm hearing about delivering newspapers. You know, I'm hearing like my own life, which I don't, you know, I just go like, oh, you just get through a lot of these things, but you have a way of elevating these things and, and capturing them and turning them into art and turning them into poetry. That's the, uh, that's, that's the hope. And that's the generous and best case scenario. I, I, I had, a, I had a conversation with John Ashbery once. Um, I did get to meet him and actually speak with him a couple of times, which, um, we were not friendly. I mean, well, we weren't not not friendly either. I mean, but uh, we weren't friends. Uh, but I did get the chance to meet him and speak with him a couple times. And uh, he said about uh, about my poetry. And actually, I think he wrote, ended up writing it on 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 one of my books at some point. That the the poems uh, the poems seem to write themselves. <laughs> this, that same that same kind of idea. Uh, and I I like that as a as a best case scenario uh, when they work. When they don't work, it really is, you know, just delivering papers, you know, and, and I don't know, I, I can still get it. I can still get excited about that. I mean, I delivered papers for seven years and I still have dreams that I'm on my paper route. Um, it's, it's those jobs, those, those, the lives we have, I, I don't know. I'm, in the future, it's, a lot of the stuff's going to be lost. Who's going to talk about delivering papers in another hundred years? I don't know. I, I think... I think every 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 dumb thing we do has value. I mean, I don't know. So I get. I I think what all all subjects are neutral. They all deserve their moment. 
I'd love to ask one more question. I know we're we're running out of out of my Q and A time, but I'm going to take a couple of minutes extra because of our technical difficulties. Because I really want to ask you about your father on the train of ghosts, which is how we started to work together. It's a collaborative book that you did with G. C. Waldrop that Bo also published. And at that time, we had published G. C.'s work, and that was the first um, piece of your work that we had done. And then we've done two books after that. But you guys, you know, it, it's so r rare to have a collaborative book of poetry with two people, first of all. And then I was always fascinated by the fact that you didn't, you resisted attributing poems to either one of you. Um, so I'd love if you could just talk a little bit about how that process started and also that idea of attribution and why that was something that you didn't want to do in that collection. Yeah, that was... It was a communal decision, but I will admit that when working with GC, I, I, was, I was in many ways taking a lot of the, uh, the working back and forth cues from GC. He, uh, he, had, he kind of presented me in some ways with the idea. Uh, I wanted to engage him uh, in, about art and I was doing it by talking about art and he wanted to do it about making it. He wanted to have that same conversation by making art rather than talking about it. And as we passed things back and forth, everything that we sent back and forth was very, um, leaned very heavily on what the other one of us wrote. And because that leaned heavily enough, uh, he wanted, he thought it would break up the book and make it seem like an anthology or it seemed like a back and forth if we, if we had page attributions. Uh, so it reads as a book when you read it, and I uh, and and he was uh, spot on right. Um, but he, as he also says, he has actually said this as well that if you're really really interested, <laughs> not you, person, you know, because you know, I mean, we talk, you know, you you. Well, I mean, I don't know if you remember, but you know who wrote what because we had that was part of that was part of the putting it together. Um, but the uh, if anyone out there in in internet land has is really curious most of the poems were published in journals. And when they were published in journals, they were published under his name or my name. So. Skeleton key. Uh, yeah, so there is, he, he, did, leave a, he did leave a trail of, of breadcrumbs on, on, on that one. Uh, and I, I, I think he's, I, I really, I thought he was right and I still think he was right. And it made us care about the book, not about our part of the book. Mm because everything became ours inside. And so revision became ours. Um, it became ours and hours and hours actually. Um, as we went, as we went, we looked at each poem. We, we uh, yeah, we did make sure that it was, it was a book that was half and half of, of, of who wrote what, um, just, just for our own, you know, shits and giggles. As, as they say, if I can, if I can say that, <laughs> maybe you I can't can say that. I don't know. Okay. Whew. Oh man. You're not the first person to swear on the internet. Oh, uh, well tonight, <laughs> I, tonight in my office, I am. <laughs> and actually John Ashbery, while we're just keeping returning to him, blurbed that book for you. No, that's yes. Yes, and, he did. Uh, he... But then my favorite blurb that you you got was Wayne Coyne from uh, <laughs> Flaming Lips. Yeah, that that's that that that's a, a long that that quote that blurb took me two years to get from him. In the end, he in the end he texted it to me like one sentence at a time. It's a great blurb too. Yeah, it was. He's he was he was actually he's 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 actually brilliant. Um, I don't I don't really know him though. I knew him for the fifteen minutes it took to. Well, I knew him for the two years texting back and forth trying to get that blurb, but then he changed his number. I think yeah. probably because of the book. I think actually, <laughs> it's like okay. He got the blurb on changing my number. There's a poem in there somewhere. I <laughs> all right, John, well, it's great talking to you always. And it's nice seeing your face. And I really appreciate you doing this. And um, thanks to Writers and Books uh, for having Tuesdays with Boa. Um, so I'm going to jump off and let you close up with one more poem. And then Dan's going to get on and say a couple more words. Um, but it was great seeing you. And uh, we'll it's see you soon. Great seeing you too. All right, bye-bye. So I think I read a I read a poem now. Um, so I will actually read a poem from your father on the train of ghosts, and it's the title poem, which I like to read. If I'm only going to read one poem from this book, I always read the title poem. 
Um, it's also one that um, I will let the cat out of the bag is mostly written by GC. Um, this, but this is one of the more uh, collaborative poems from the book. I wrote the title and uh, he wrote um, most of the rest of the poem, actually, or maybe all of the rest of the poem. I don't know. I'll say, if you like the poem, I'll say he wrote most of it. If you don't like the poem, I'll say he wrote all of it. Your Father and the Train of Ghosts. Your father steps on board the train of ghosts. You watch him from the platform. Somehow, he doesn't look as old as you expected him to be. You think this must have something to do with the light or maybe how much bigger the train is. It stretches down the track a long way, as far as your eyes can make out. It's like a black bullet that keeps speeding toward you, you think. And then, no, it's like a very long train, that's all. Somewhere on board the train, your father is choosing a seat. Maybe he's already found one. He settles in. He picks up a magazine or newspaper someone else left lying there. He's flipping through it idly. Maybe he's looking out the window for you, you would like to think, waving, or only you'll never see it because of the reflected glare. Or maybe he's not looking for you at all. Maybe he's watching the hot air balloons that have just appeared all over the sky, ribbing like airborne hearts of the giants Jack killed. In the stories, Jack has no father. This would explain a lot, you're thinking, as the train begins to pull away. His misplaced affections, stealing the harp of gold that played all by itself. Around you, men and women and children are standing on the platform, shouting, waving, hugging themselves. The wind is cold. It must be March. You would want that kind of music if you were Jack, wouldn't you? Um, the funny thing about that poem is, uh, as I was reading it, I missaid uh, one of the uh, verbs in one of the uh, sentences. And then, so I had to keep changing the tense after that, all the way through that, that, that part of the poem. And that was, a, that was a, a little game I had to play for myself right there, going, going through that. But uh, thank you all, thank you all very much uh, for that. And uh, I think Dan is coming on now. Hi, Dan. Hi. Welcome. That, that, Welcome that to was, our evening. Uh, that was wonderful. Thank you for reading. Um, and thank you for being here. Thank you to Peter Connors um, uh, and everyone who attended uh, by the book. I'll put that link one more time. Um, and uh, uh, thank you for all for coming. Uh, our next Tuesday with Boa will be with Matt Morton on uh, January 5th. So uh, we hope to see you there. And uh, thank you and have a good night. And, uh, and uh, yes, and thank you. And, and uh, thank you all in the chat. Uh, thank you, Jeff, um, and all the other people in the chat and, the, uh, and, and such.